and Max, um, I remember being at an AV in the UK. This was probably 2015, 2016. And what happened in 2014 in Gaza was huge mm. uh, operation protective edge, as the Israelis call mm -hmm. it. And you gave a talk on Gaza, and it, that wasn't necessarily at the forefront of everybody because the Syrian war was raging by then. Mm -hmm. There was other things that are happening in the world. That was what you did your talk on because you had just came back or you'd recently been to Gaza. summer of 2014, the IDF launched Operation Protective Edge in Gaza to stop rockets from the uh, south and to eliminate the threat of cross-border tunnels into Israeli territory. Five years later, we're here to discuss this issue uh, with uh, a general, Yom Tov Samia, good evening, who used to command the Southern Command and used to be the vice commander of Protective Edge Operation. Looking backwards five years, did Israel achieve its goals in Protective Edge Operation? Does Israel have the goals before the operation? No, I ask you. No. Okay, explain. No. Israel, unfortunately, doesn't have any strategy how to deal with the Palestinian issue in general, with the Hamas issue in particular, and furthermore, with the Gaza Strip in this situation while a terror organization is holding two million Palestinians as prisoners. And since we don't have strategy, and since we don't act in the shadow of a strategy during the last three operations, 11 years, all the, all, all the world blames us of the situation. The Hamas are the hero guys of the story. The, uh, uh, the people in Gaza are the poor guy of the story, and Israel is the one to blame. And I know we don't have time to hear the, the, the long-form version of that story. You could probably give us a little synopsis for people who don't know, who might be watching this, but suffice to say that was a life-changing experience for you, or that really just blew your mind? Yeah, well, you go to Gaza, you hear all these things about Palestine and what it's really like, and I just, I just went there. We snuck in through a rebel tunnel we didn't tell anybody we were from, coming. From Egypt. From Egypt, or from the Sinai, through Rafa. And we were like, a little, little tiny tunnel, it was only like this, this high, you know. Were there, were there light bulbs in there, like Christmas lights? There were like? light bulbs at every turn, like which might be, you know, 500 meters away. Like, so you're kind of in the dark. We had a little torch, a little tiny so torch. We're crawling on our hands and knees. It's dirt. It's dirt. Dirt tunnel, 50 meters underground, crawl through, they, in, underground for probably an hour and a half, crawling on our hands and knees to get into Gaza. And uh, we didn't tell anyone we were coming. And when I got in there, it was it was a world of children. It was just children, like so many children that I've have never seen so many children in one city, uh, all over the streets. The average age in Gaza is 17. You know, when you, when you look at it all, and, and these are terrorists, we're told. You know, and I went there. I ran around with a video camera for uh, for 10 days and and started filming things. And you know, there was nothing like what they told us Gaza was really like and I just thought well okay well, this is this is what's really going on it, even while I was there we, we did YouTube videos and posted it on YouTube and we're halfway through a podcast and there's pounding on the door and it's Hamas come knocking on the door halfway through a podcast to ask us if we could come into the Ministry of Interior the next day to explain our presence in Gaza I thought that's pretty good if I was in another country they'd just arrest me and take me to jail for Ill Ill illegally entering their country Hamas and other terrorist groups in Gaza are firing rockets on cities throughout the state of Israel, on Tel Aviv, Jerusalem, Haifa, Beersheba, Sderot, and other cities. No country on earth would remain passive in the face of hundreds of rockets fired on its cities, and Israel is no exception. Today we expanded our operations against Hamas and the other terrorist groups in Gaza. We'll continue to protect our civilians against Hamas attacks on them. Now Hamas, by contrast, is deliberately putting Palestinian civilians into harm's way. It embeds its terrorists in hospitals, in schools, in mosques, apartment buildings throughout the Gaza Strip. Hamas is thus committing a double war crime. It targets Israeli civilians while hiding behind Palestinian civilians. This operation could take time. We're resolved to defend our families and our homes. Today I spoke with several world leaders. I appreciated their expressions of strong support for our right and our duty to defend ourselves. And this is what we'll continue to do.
on October 2, 2024, several rockets were fired at Israel from Lebanon. This escalation has drawn significant attention due to the growing tensions in the region, particularly between Israeli forces and groups such as Hezbollah, which is backed by Iran. These rocket attacks are seen as part of the broader struggle for control and influence in the Middle East. For Israel, such attacks represent a threat to its security. While for many Muslims, especially in Lebanon and Palestine, these strikes are part of the resistance against Israeli occupation and aggression. But why does this ongoing conflict matter so much to Muslims beyond the immediate political issues? The answer lies in the connection to Islamic prophecies about the end of times. The role of Jerusalem and Al-Aqsa Mosque. One of the central reasons why any conflict involving Israel garners so much attention from Muslims worldwide is the significance of Jerusalem, specifically the Al-Aqsa Mosque. In Islamic tradition, Al-Aqsa is one of the three holiest mosques in Islam, and it holds deep spiritual importance due to its association with the Prophet Muhammad's, peace be upon him, miraculous night journey. Many Islamic scholars interpret current events, especially those related to Jerusalem and its surroundings, as aligning with some of the prophecies related to the end times. The increasing tensions in the Holy Land, including the rocket attacks, are seen as part of a larger plan in which the status of Jerusalem plays a major role. In one famous hadith, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, When Jerusalem flourishes, Yathrib, Medina, will be in ruins. Some scholars interpret this as a sign that the focus of global events will shift to Jerusalem as we get closer to the end of times, and these recent attacks and clashes are seen as moving towards this prophecy. The Dajjal, Antichrist, and the Final Battle Another important figure in Islamic eschatology is the Dajjal, or the Antichrist, who is said to emerge during the end times and bring about widespread corruption and destruction. In Islamic tradition, the Dajjal will appear from the East and will aim to deceive and mislead humanity. Many believe that the growing unrest in the Middle East, especially around Israel, is setting the stage for the rise of the Dajjal. Some Muslim scholars see Israel's increasing strength and the conflict over Jerusalem as part of the larger puzzle. The location of the rocket attacks coming from Lebanon, which lies to the north of Israel, further fuels the idea that the Dajjal's emergence may be linked to escalating violence in this region. the Mahdi and the Muslim army. Muslims also believe in the coming of the Mahdi, a leader who will unite the Muslim Ummah community and restore justice during the end of times. One of the prophecies regarding the Mahdi is that he will lead Muslims in a great war, often referred to as the Malhama or great battle against the forces of evil, including the Dajjal. Some Muslims see the ongoing struggles between Israel and Muslim nations, including rocket attacks and military responses, as part of the build-up to this final battle. Hezbollah's involvement in these rocket launches and the broader conflict with Israel can be interpreted by some as part of this prophecy. Iran, which supports Hezbollah, often frames its opposition to Israel in religious terms, seeing itself as standing up for the rights of Muslims, especially those oppressed in Palestine. This framing adds to the idea that these conflicts are not merely political, but part of a larger divine plan. 
Former President Donald Trump today, again, referring to the conflict as a possible World War III. A short time ago, Iran launched 181 ballistic missiles at Israel, and uh, we, we just, it's, I've been talking about World War III for a long time, and I don't want to make predictions because the predictions always come true. We're not going to make, but they are very close to global catastrophe. We have a non-existent president and a non-existent vice president who should be in charge, but nobody knows what's going on. In northern Israel, it was clear this attack was different. No! You! 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 This is, uh, this is, this is tough now. Right now in October, the world seems like it's falling apart. Uh, yeah, it's not just this. It's the longshoremen. It's the economy. It's the, everything's going up. Okay, and to that point, an escalation that draws the U.S. in, might that be uh, an issue where we could see the U.S. going after Iran's nuclear program? We know that that has been a thorn uh, in uh, the Biden administration's side for some time now. <laughs> Okay. Okay, guys, we got to get off the roof. These are coming down right next to us here. Israel's Prime Minister Netanyahu vowing to retaliate against Iran for the attack. But, you know, Israel has not had an attack like this from Iran in its history. And the mood of defiance there you heard from Benjamin Netanyahu suggests that Israel is going to respond with force. It's another incredibly dangerous moment in a conflict now which has lasted almost exactly a year and is spreading across the Middle East. The country says 90% of those missiles hit their targets. The U.S. confirming our forces helped to defend against the attack. And again, this is significant because it is the first time, according to Iranian state television, that the Iranians used the Fatah 4 hypersonic ballistic missile. Back in April, when Iran attacked Israel, they didn't use hypersonic ballistic missiles of this caliber, the latest that they have in their arsenal. And the military says that there have been other strikes. But as far as we know, in a very sad irony, the only person killed uh, was a Palestinian from Gaza who happened to be in the West Bank. Uh, and not, uh, we're not really sure how, how he died, but certainly the amount of shrapnel flying around was lethal. We'll have uh, more details on that tomorrow. Okay, Liz Palmer, thank you for that account. We can feel the tension in your counting there. Let's just hear, listen into what's happening in Jerusalem right now. 